July 7th, 2020 eWeb board meeting. And I am um, stepping in for Commissioner Mattel, who's out of town. And I think that I am mostly well acquainted with Robert's rules of order. But if I make a mistake, please feel free to chime in and correct me. Um, so we're going to start off with item one, which is an agenda check. Is there anybody who has anything that they would like to add? I see a no from Commissioner Carlson, no from Commissioner Helgeson, Frank, nothing. OK, then we'll go on to agenda item two. Uh, items from board members and a general manager COVID update. So I think maybe if we go in alphabetical order by last name, that would be easiest maybe for me to keep track of. So um, Commissioner Carlson, we'll start with you. Uh, this month attended an LCOG meeting and an LCOG executive meeting uh, by you know, uh, Zoom. Um, other than that, not not too much going on other than you know, just trying to get through the day to day. Appreciate again all of staff's work to deal with these challenging times. I know it's not easy out there, so you know, I don't think I can say it enough appreciation for all of you, what you do to keep the lights on, keep the water running. Um, so that's what I have. Thanks. Great. Commissioner Helgeson. OK, well, um, I haven't had the opportunity to attend any meetings this month, given that we're kind of in the situation we're in. I too will join in expressing my appreciation for all of staff's efforts to manage the utilities affairs in these times. The only thing I wanted to call attention to um, was that I received probably somewhat belatedly because it was sent in the mail and would otherwise have been distributed at a board meeting. Um, our um, uh, last year's um, water quality report. I'm sure that you all received that as well. And I just um, wanted to acknowledge um, how incredible uh, the information is that's reported there with respect to our water quality. I think it's easy for that to wash over us. Um, as we get fairly consistent um, results reported each year. But um, I can tell you from my experience that there aren't a lot of water utilities that can show those kinds of lab results consistently over time. I know that that um, the EPA has at least a couple dozen uh, items that are items of concern with respect to drinking water and reporting. Um, uh, their content um, and the only ones that I saw in the report that related to our water were largely just the result of our disinfection process which continues to improve with the changes that were made last year and I I just call that out because um, it's it is pretty incredible and uh, we, we have a tendency to take it for granted so I just uh, also appreciated the clarity of the report given that much of the format is prescribed by the EPA and it's a little hard to put that information out in a customer friendly way, so I think we do a good job there as well. And so my appreciation staff and that's all I have for tonight. Great. Um, I don't really have anything to add. I was hoping to give an update on a meeting that we had scheduled with the city of Eugene to talk about our work together around uh, sustainability and um, climate change but that was canceled by the city. So this is the second one that's been canceled and I realize that they have a lot on their plate right now, but um, I would like to figure out a way to get back on track with that. And Frank, maybe you have a little bit more insight because I know that you meet with um, the city manager. So you, I don't know if you have any, any insight on that, but that is all I have to add. Over to you, Frank. Yes, uh, uh, Commissioner Schlossberg, thank you. Commissioners, good evening. Um, I just have a couple of updates um, re regarding the city's postponement. I, I believe it, it's temporary, um, Commissioner. Um, speaking with the city manager, they're pretty inundated with a number of things, uh, not just the, the COVID issues, but also kind of the civil unrest that's taking place in the city. And so um, I have had a number of conversations with the city manager. Um, I know one of the agenda items um, on our August agenda is to talk about the headquarters building. And so 
Um, she and I are also talking about um, that as well. So a number of topics that the city manager and I continue to discuss. Um, I did want to thank uh, Commissioner Helgeson for his comments about the water quality report. That's that's really uh, a team effort. Karen Kelly and the water management team um, that works as part of her staff and then also our communications team with which takes a lot of and Renee Gonzalez, uh, who's manager of that group, uh, they take a lot of a very sort of wonky technical information and try to massage it in a way that is uh, clear and understandable to customers. And in as you know, uh, that's not always an easy task. And so thanks for recognizing the work there. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Andrew Janos and kind of the staff and the team that he put together to help the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, with some temporary electric service to help with the uh, fish sorting and counting uh, and hatchery on the, the, I guess it's the, the left bank uh, at Lieberg. Um, we've done some and are doing some work with them to help facilitate that. And so Andrew and, and really the multiple departments that have kind of worked with him on that uh, deserve some acknowledgement. Um, and other than that, I think uh, if you want to, um, uh, Vice President Schlossberg, I, I can just jump into the COVID update if that's appropriate uh, at this point. And um, I know that um, the commissioners had asked for kind of a regular update regarding COVID and so that this was probably the appropriate time in the agenda to do that. I just have a couple of slides that kind of highlight where we're at. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, Holly, I'd appreciate that. Holly's our producer tonight. So thank you. As as you know, we, we do a pretty in-depth analysis of what's going on externally as well as internally. Externally, infection cases are going up. Uh, this is the, the latest chart we have from Lane County. Um, so you can see some, some exponential almost increases uh, recently uh, in cases here locally. Uh, on the good news side, um, hospital capacity remains um, um, really good in Lane County. I actually don't believe there's any hospitalization uh, cases as of this morning. And so that's just one of the many uh, factors we look at externally. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we do have a, a pretty organized, intentional approach to uh, kind of our crisis response. Um, we are in what I would term uh, somewhere between reintegration and recovery. You can kind of see the highlighted yellow. Reintegration is really more of our internal uh, where are we at? And then recovery are, is part of how we're helping the community relative to continuation and uh, a supply of electricity and water and also the ability and programs to, to help pay bills. Uh, go ahead with the next slide. Um, you know, as you can see, you know, we are in reintegration. We have a combination. Our office staff is really a mix of kind of in office and as well as uh, telecommuting or telework. Um, we have a number of people that continue to, to telecommute. We are uh, not limiting meetings per se, but um, as far as access to buildings, we can have meetings. They are restricted in size. Uh, we also do a lot with virtual meetings like we are with the commissioners this evening. And so uh, we, we are not restricting people from coming into the building. It's really more of the effectiveness at this point. There are certain positions that are just more effective um, in the building versus telecommuting. And those were there's a, there's a real mix at this point. Uh, there are conditions of entry. Uh, for example, where we have some higher densities, we are doing some pre-screening and temperature screening, for example, and we continue to employ distance and, and appropriate PPE. This is really a kind of a multi-layered approach. Um, as you can see, kind of the table in the upper right-hand corner of this, this slide, um, the rock occupancy is continuing to kind of slowly and steadily increase, which was part of our plan um, to really control the density. Headquarters is remaining pretty constant, about 35 to 38. That is mostly the, the call center, which is split between the first floor and the third floor, fortunately, because we had the space to be able to provide some isolation and distance there. 
uh, consumption so far, and you'll hear this actually throughout a number of the scenarios that we talk about tonight, uh, about 4% on the electric side seems to be what we can attribute to kind of economy or COVID related. There's there's always other factors like weather and uh, you know, a key account we've, uh, which um, Ar Aroico, which decided to, um, Willamette Industries basically decided to close as of May. So there's some impact there, but about 4% related to the economic conditions around uh, COVID. So far, water, very little variance due to that, but we're just, um, as you know, entering the more, the, the higher consumption season. Um, last week, we did start launching our uh, customer recovery programs. Um, it's been very well received and we've uh, very intentionally and, and specifically reached out to accounts that are delinquent or in, in the collection process. Uh, we've reduced that significantly uh, from over, uh, I believe it was over 2,000, uh, or actually close to 3,000 disconnect orders uh, down to about 2,300. Many of those agreeing to the payment plans that we've presented. And so um, while that number is, is high, uh, there's some encouragement based on the, the outreach that we're doing to customers and the programs that we're offering to customers. I did provide the commissioners with um, a link to and some information regarding our different programs for, to to help customers. And so next slide, please. And so we, we continue to kind of work our way through the process. Uh, we're very and you'll see this tonight. We're, we're very sensitive to the rate trajectory kind of coming into COVID versus where we're headed. Um, we we know there's a sensitivity to that, but we also know there's investments we need to make, and we'll talk a lot about that uh, later in the meeting. Uh, there's some a projection as to budget gaps because of consumption, um, and then you know we're really just spending a lot of time, uh, and and I think our um, our customer solutions group, and uh, as well as the operations group that supported, have done a really good job uh, reaching out. Um, to uh, customers about different programs and, and really specialized terms more than anything. They don't have a, they're not an investment per se from a budget perspective. Um, and so we remain really diligent. I think that we're working our way through it, um, but externally, as, as many of you know, there are spikes, um, many of those relative and maybe after the, the Memorial Day weekend, um, we're you know, kind of expecting that we'll see much of the same relative to the 4th of July holiday. So um, with that, that's that's kind of the, the quick snapshot update. If you had any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those. Um, and I think that, you know, that gives you a feel for kind of where we're at and where we're headed. I, I think... Carlson, you have a question? Uh, yeah, real quick. So you said that we're getting the number of accounts that are past due kind of down. Are we still seeing, I mean, from my perspective, I know the economy is opening back up, people are getting back to work, but are you anticipating that, you know, we're going to have another bump and um, as in unemployment benefits, uh, decrease that we'll probably have more people kind of joining in that mix again. I'm, I'm really worried about what's going to happen after, you know, some of the unemployment benefits uh, come out and what what you're hearing in the industry, what what people are modeling there. Yeah, I think um, as far as what we're hearing in the industry, um, a lot of the same numbers relative to decreased consumption. We are hearing that other utilities do have an increase in the number of past due accounts. We're, we're, we have seen an upward trend. Um, I think what's interesting is our, uh, more recently through kind of aggressive outreach, I would call it, um, and very intentional outreach, we've um, gotten a number of customers to sign up for more of a, of a payment plan um, but I, I think it's a legitimate concern, Commissioner, that as there's ups and downs in 
I, I would call it the difference between, say, unemployment and the federal aid that accompanies unemployment. As you, if if that gap uh, gap grows or shrinks, then the people's ability to pay things like electric bills or water bills or, in fact, other bills becomes more at risk. And so, um, while we're not projecting that it gets significantly you know, falls off the edge of the cliff. I think it is is a very valid point that you bring up relative to to unemployment aid and and um, the CARES Act, which carried through a while, and then you know the next version of that, which which we're hearing about. So, um, I, I think it's going to be the the difference the difference sort of the delta between the the what's unemployment and then what aid is provided we've we've advocated through the state and through our federal contacts for for direct aid as opposed to tools such as um, moratoriums on disconnects and things i think direct aid is probably a more effective way so but it's a very legitimate concern that that you bring up Go ahead, Commissioner Hogason. I just want to chime in sharing that concern. For me, it's um, it would be premature for us to take further action at this point, but I certainly would hope that, that you would monitor things in terms of what staff is seeing and experiencing. And when you reach a point where you feel like the resources and the programs and the flexibility that we've afforded to this point, combined with whatever the feds are doing or not doing. If, if, if you see us reaching a point where we need to revisit that conversation, um, you know, I'd, I'd rather be out ahead of that than, you know, at least in terms of our thinking about what the options are. And, but on the other hand, I, I don't think we need to take any action until you see that we're moving into a position where that becomes a concern. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Commissioner Helgeson. I, I agree. I think it's part of, you know, we've we've started looking at our aging numbers um, in a lot more uh, discreet um, and detailed way, partly to to get some um, pre warning or uh, pre trending as to maybe uh, future problems. If, as you know, as you've been there, if, if you wait till the to the 80 or 90 days late before you start doing anything, then it's too late. Um, so we're starting to look at the trends early. Um, Deborah Hart and, and and her team are um, really constantly trying to look at those numbers. And if for any reason we think we're getting to an exposure level or we're, we're outstripping our ability to uh, handle that type of risk, we will raise our hands and come back to the board and uh, with some, not just what the, the problem looks like, but also potential solutions. So I think that um, appreciate that very much. Just another quick thought on that, and that's that um, I appreciate that we are making um, extended payment arrangements and that that seems to be a mechanism that's in, in some ways responsive. Um, I do have a concern, though, that as we move into the fall and, and certainly the winter, people's bills will be going back up. And, um, you know, if they're not able to work off their arrearages between now and, and that time, then then they're kind of um, pushing a rock uphill. So I, right. I think it's um it's something that we have to balance and, and um, pay attention to. And I think your eyes and ears are the best reconnaissance for for us, so just keep us informed. Yep, absolutely, Commissioner. I think it's a great point. Uh, it's part of why we really wanted to get started now. I think the just the consumption levels over really now through, you know, October, maybe November are at a level where there is the opportunity to do that. Once you get into the winter months, when the electric portion of the bill starts to to increase dramatically, it's it's a tougher challenge. So. Um, think really, oh, you know, keeping track of this over the next several months is going to uh, be important for setting us up for maybe a more difficult period, depending on the, the the timing of of aid packages versus where we are in our overall COVID and unemployment and you know post COVID economy. I think that's that's an incredibly important point that 
that you bring up. So um, um, kudos to the team for really starting to push through that now, but definitely your concerns are warranted and we'll keep you posted. And I think that's part of why uh, Mindy and Steve wanted to have a COVID update as part of the normal uh, board process is just, you know, where are we at with things like this? And I think that's a good thing to do. So I'm fully in agreement with that. Great. And I believe that Commissioner Brown has joined the meeting. So um, if you are here, John, and would like, if you have any items that you would like to add, this yeah, is your I, time to do so. Can you, can you hear me okay? I've been here since the beginning. And uh, I don't didn't know why I wasn't included, but that's OK. Uh, I'm seeing everybody and hearing everybody. But uh, anyhow, um, yeah, no items from the board members. I echo what Dick said about the water quality report. I appreciate it. Frank, your COVID update. Um, that's very informative. But what does you know from 3000 to 2300? That's still a lot of people that aren't going to be, be able to have a refrigerated food in the summer. And 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 if it's that bad now, uh, the winter is going to be there's some trends I've seen that are not very pretty. What does 2300 shutoffs relate to? How was that a year ago at this time? Yeah, I, I think typically we're in the few hundred range. If, if, if you remember right a few years ago, it was probably a couple thousand. Uh, we've worked uh, through a number of different processes to lower that. We we got it down to a few hundred, uh, which would be normally what we would see. If I remember right, it was about 300. Um, now it you know it's, it's sort of spiked up to 3,000, and we're working our way back down. Um, it's I would say that of that um, 2,000, you know, 2,500, whatever the number is, 2,300. Um, there's most of that is residential some of that is a small business but it's it is definitely higher um certainly something that um we've we've also um kind of included in our budgetary and financial process thinking and when it comes to risk mitigation i i think it's an it's an absolute important number to keep track of um, and your point is, as well as the other commissioners, is valid. It's it's an indicator of sort of economic health and and also one of risk from our perspective. So um, if and if there's things where you know maybe there's there's one time reserves that are used for certain things. Um, if if it comes to that, then we would be talking to the board about that. But it's. It's something we're actively working now. I think there's an opportunity to actively work it, but we don't want to do it uh, in an ignorant way. And so um, as we go through the summer, we'll keep the board posted as to what those trends look like. But, um, you know, relatively speaking, it's it's uh, significantly higher than it was a year ago. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. I echo what everybody else has said. And um, additionally, I just worry about um, in the winter time when children maybe are at school during the day and parents are at work and they're not usually maybe needing to heat their houses during the day and what's gonna happen when everybody's home in the winter time. Um, just making sure that everybody can stay safe and warm. But sounds like we are on track with monitoring that. So I appreciate that, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Okay, so we are moving on to um, action item four, which is approval of consent calendar A. We'll and move, move to adopt. Second. Okay. Um, any, I guess, I'm just, any objections? Is that what I'm supposed to ask? <laughs> Any discussion, I suppose. Uh, okay. Otherwise, call call for the call for the vote. Okay. Is there any discussion? Any need for discussion? I, I just want to note that I had um, indicated that I had a few questions about item 11, but those were uh, masterfully responded to by Deborah this afternoon. I think you saw her response, so I don't need to pull that item. Okay. And there's a motion and a second. And all those in favor, raise your right hand and say aye. 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 All right. Looks like consent calendar A passes as is. Moving on to item number five, approval of consent calendar B. I'd like um, Mindy, quick point. You might want to note that um, 
Commissioner Mattel, President Mattel is an excused, so he's okay. not voting. Just, I don't know how that works with the record. But anyway. Okay, President Mattel is excused and he is not voting. Okay, um, approval of consent calendar B. I'd like to pull number eight for discussion, please. Okay. Move to approve the balance, minus eight. Second. All right. Uh, do we vote on, I guess we'll vote on that. All those in favor of consent calendar B minus item number eight, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All right, so that is approved. And um, we can discuss item number eight. Well, I, I pulled it and I, I gave some pre-meeting uh, questions and Rod answered them very skillfully, but I still have questions about process. Um, and maybe Frank, you or, or Rod can answer this, but um, you know, we, like I said, we rely on LIDAR extensively and in its accuracy. And when we say it was off by 40%, and apparently we didn't have like a pre-bid meeting on site to have these people come up and look at this because we're just taking the contractor's word for it that it's another hundred and, uh, $122,000. Um, I just the whole process kind of bothers me about the way this has come down. So can you shed some light on um, how reliable LIDAR is? Because we use it to do all our riparian areas. And number two, do we have a process where we do you know pre-bid walkthroughs to, to say, you know, I, I do logging and things on some of our properties and I understand um, the, the issue here, but I, the process just doesn't seem right to me. Could you maybe help me get through this? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, mention a couple of things and then I'm, maybe Rod can em, can embellish this a little bit. I think, you know, we, we do use LIDAR on, for a number of different purposes. And, and I think, you know, one of the lessons learned um, from this process in particular uh, relative to, you know, a forestry type of application where the larger trees were counted accurately, but some of the undergrowth and smaller trees were not, uh, I think that, um, it has its limitations and it's probably, you know, lesson learned. We would probably do it a little bit different next time um, in, in this kind of application. Now, a little bit different here was we we were using a process where we it was a kind of a per unit or, you know, per tree basis. And so um, even though the count was off, the the per unit cost was was what we were really using LIDAR to originally estimate. And so um, the overall cost would have probably been about the same or would have been the, been the same. Um, but I think there is a, a lesson learned relative to where you can use LIDAR effectively and maybe where you would not use LIDAR effectively. Um, we do have history here with the contractor and the, the bid process. And so um, we overall used it to, to create a ballpark. I think after that we did the walkthrough, but I think there are times when you maybe just want to do a walkthrough from the beginning. Um, and so I, th I think you're you're right. There's there's times when maybe we would adjust the process to do that. Um, I don't know if Rod wants to jump in and add anything more to that, but um, I, I, I do think that because this was a per unit um, process that uh, or proposal that um, the cost went up because the units went up um, and then the administrative fee was held held the same. So um, yeah, I, I think there's some lessons to be learned in the process there. Rod, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I guess the only other thing I'd say real quick too though that um, since this is not really a timber harvest per se, it was more about a habitat mitigation that uh, the other part to the bid was really based on experience um, uh, uh, manipulating the undergrowth and, and and managing that part of the project and and so we've had uh, past experience with with these folks this contractor before so they were the clear um, clear winner in this particular um, bid um, anyway and so uh, yeah absolutely lesson learned we've we've talked about it as a group that uh, we'll we'll do a walkthrough next time and take take a little extra time. Um, LIDAR though is uh, is a very useful tool. Um, I'm not sure if this, we are working on a, a new LIDAR contract to, to redo the um, 
basically our whole area with the forest service that um, so we'll, we'll be getting some more LIDAR information, but it, it's a very useful tool and very accurate for for what it is and what what you actually contract it for. You can get as accurate as, as you want. And, and I don't know the particulars on this uh, um, LIDAR uh, data set, but I'm guessing it wasn't set up for for the undergrowth. So um, yeah, it's just kind of the it's one of those uh, lessons learned, but I would also say that we have a really good experience with this contractor uh, and we've also verified this with staff and in, in NWA so we don't feel like we're getting um, overcharged here. Okay and just a clarifying question because I, I had a question from a couple constituents about but they've uh, Forest Service has done this before trying to mimic mother nature by putting the woody debris in the stream for fish habitat and I agree I, I like that but um, they're not doing it. Uh, they're not taking the root wads, and so the last time I think they did this, they said in the in the last flood, all the all the stuff just went down the river because they're just cutting logs, and that's not mimicking Mother Nature. They're cutting the trees, or putting them in the river, and then when it floods, all the all the logs go down the river. Are they going to do anything to put root wads or leave the root wads on the trees, and uh, so they don't just roll down the river when it floods? Yep. Now you're stepping into Mike McCann's territory. Mike, uh, can you address that? at all happy to and uh and yes the uh, uh commissioner brown the contract is that that's part of the advantage of having mckenzie watershed council um manage the logging for us is that uh they're getting the trees exactly as they want them for their habitat and okay. so they're leaving all the root wads on thank um, you yep yeah, and so that's all going to be good hey, thank you very much that's a uh, very good answers i'm ready to i'm i'm done i'm ready to vote yeah, I think Commissioner Brown, though, I, I would like to acknowledge that we, well, it may not have changed the outcome in this case. I think your your point is received relative to evaluating the process going forward um, and LIDAR and its ap applicable uses. So we, we want to acknowledge that from uh, the point that you bring up. So thank you. Thank you. I'll move to adopt uh, number uh, eight on consent calendar B. Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All right. Item eight uh, passes. And I realized that I skipped over the public input reading. I'm really sorry about that. So I think, Frank, that you, are you going to read or is it just put into the public record? Well, there was there. I guess you sh you can um, sort of <laughs> open the public testimony portion first, um, Commissioner Schlossberg, and then I will take it from there. There's one that was short enough that I will read, uh, but I will acknowledge the two pieces of of public input correspondence that we got. So if you want to open the public input to start, then I will take it from there. OK, I am opening the public input portion. Great. Well, thank you, Commissioner. We received two uh, pieces of public input. Um, one was from Will Rutherford that we would acknowledge. Um, it was regarding and passed along to commissioners um, relative to the upriver cost of service analysis. And so um, it was approximately five pages uh, well written from Will. Will Rutherford is, uh, for the record, a resident of VITA. And so he's provided that and we will attach that as part of the minutes for um, for future review as part of the record. Uh, the other piece of correspondence um, and testimony was received by Webb Sussman. Uh, Webb uh, Sussman is a resident of Eugene and I will just read that um, into the record and it says. Uh, so here we go to Mr. Lawson and the board. The Springfield Utility Board is moving forward where eWeb is stuck back in the 1900s. An example, greetings Technology Association of Oregon in the Southern Willamette Valley. I'm Sally Bell, the new Vice President and Executive Director. And I have some hot off the press news to share about fiber in Springfield, net neighborhoods, and now live this week thanks to Springfield Utility Board and XS media to increase community access to high-speed internet. 
XS Media is the first provider installing fiber in Springfield homes and businesses for this program. The net neighborhood concept is part of the Springfield Infinet suite of telecommunications infrastructure tools and is the first of its kind in Oregon. Interested service providers and potential customers can find info springfieldinfinet.com. Here's to more participants and service providers and potential customers to find info. Technology Association of Oregon in cooperation with Sub and XS Media. If you're interested in service like this, apparently, uh, excuse me, <laughs> here, here's more to come in partnerships, innovation in our neighborhoods, unquote. So here's where Webb picks it up um, outside of the quotes. Technology Association of Oregon in cooperation with Sub and XS Media. If you're interested in service like this, apparently you can either move yourself or your business or both to Springfield and join the 21st century, or you can elect new eWeb board members in the upcoming elections. If I sound a little frustrated, it's because eWeb has been, quote, discussing, unquote, this type of service for the past 25 years. Sincerely, Web Sussman. This will also, uh, commissioners, be put into the minutes. There was one sentence in there. I got a little bit mixed up on the on the lines at the very end, so I apologize. Um, but I think you got the gist of the email from Mr. Sussman. And I think with that, um, uh, Vice President Schlossberg, you can close the public testimony. And if there's any commissioner comments, um, they can go from there. OK, I'm closing. Uh, public input and is there anybody who would like to say a few words? Commissioner Helgeson. I, I just quickly would want to respond to the testimony that, that you've just read from Mr. Sussman. Um, I, I don't agree with the notion that we're behind the curve on this. Um, my experience is that we're actually ahead of the curve in terms of having installed a significant investment in fiber optics in the community which we've used among other things to provide high-speed internet to the schools and more recently to um to a major um, upgrade to internet service in the downtown area um, and uh, also to participate in the public area network by contributing fiber to that so i think we've been just as much or more um, assertive in this arena. We've just chosen to prioritize uh, that work differently. I think the other thing that I would comment on is, is that the reason that we have not to this point looked at broader deployment community wide is because um, we were unable and have been un unable to find a way to do that cost effectively uh, in ways that would allow us to be competitive. Um, now that situation is something that may change over time with technology and the build out of things like our AMI capability. Um, and I would say at, at a point at which staff feels that we're in a position to take another look at that, um, that at least I as one board member would be willing to consider ways that we could um, continue to broaden that um, presence in the community. Um, but I think we have made those investments and that the community has benefited in very significant ways and we continue to have an interest in broadening that where we can cost effectively. Um, I'd be interested in knowing more. I'll research on my own more about what subs doing to see if they found something that might be adaptable for us. But I just I, I would disagree with the characterization that we uh, are behind the curve or have not made those investments for the benefit of the community. Thank you. Sonia or John, either of you have any comments? None from me. Okay. None from Sonia. Um, I guess I would just like to say I'm, I'm interested in the argument that web poses. I don't really know much about it, so I'm interested in just hearing a little bit more at a different time about our history of what we've what we've done with that. Um, I do believe that our internet should be a public utility. I don't know that 
our water and electric board is the one to take that on necessarily, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to learning more about that. So thank you to Webb and to Will for submitting public testimony. Um, we're gonna move on to our general business items. Item number seven, electric and water long-term financial plan and update and our 2021 budget assumptions. And it's gonna be presented by Deborah Hart, the Chief Financial Officer. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Deborah. Uh, thank you and good evening, commissioners. Uh, we are here this evening to share a long-term financial plan update as well as get direction on our budget assumptions for 2021. My uh, name is Deborah Hart and here with me this evening is Adam Rue. He's our fiscal services supervisor and Alicia Voorhees, the senior analyst. And then we also have a special guest appearance in this presentation from General Manager Lawson. Uh, so tonight we plan to talk a little bit about where we are to date, uh, after which we'll review the long-term financial plan and the proposed budget assumptions. Uh, we'll be sure to leave time for board discussion and direction. Uh, Frank, though, is going to start off with some context around our planning process and the economic conditions. Frank? Yeah, thank you, Deborah. I, I don't know that I've ever been termed a special guest before, but uh, I appreciate the, the characterization. Um, commissioners, I just wanted to start off with, with a couple of slides. Um, some of this uh, you know as commissioners, but I also wanted to make sure that people who may be tuning in um, from the general public or, or others even within staff kind of understand how this process works. There's a number of moving pieces and so I wanted to kind of run through uh, how the long-term financial plan and capital plan and strategic plan and budgets kind of all fit together. Um, it's not necessarily a linear process um, but I'll, I'll kind of start on the far left side of this slide. The two areas in yellow are really what we're asking the board for tonight. Um, it's for guidance around economic assumptions on the long-term financial plan. Those obviously work in concert with uh, the long-term investments that we make around capital planning. And so um, guidance around priorities with that and those, those definitely work hand in hand. Uh, we tend to take a 10-year view at least on paper with that. I know that uh, Deborah and her team look beyond the 10 years, for example, when it comes to the, the financial metrics. Those are done uh, from a long-term basis in the context of the strategic plan. Uh, those then roll out into developing annual revenue requirements um, and then a cost of service analysis and other things lead to what that means as far as specific rate actions. And then usually starting October and going through December, the far right where we ask for, we have public hearings on the actual rates and then um, seek board approval on those rates as well as the, the annual operating and capital budgets uh, for the following year. And these, this process is for both with the water utility and the electric utility. So I just wanted to kind of explain where all this kind of fits together. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the things that came up uh, in our discussion last month, we wanted to make sure that the commissioners had a little bit of financial backdrop and, and context to this was we did a number of financial stress testing for both the electric and water utilities. Um, this was under uh, some forecasted economic changes that we were um, um, anticipating as a result of, of the economy, the kind of the post COVID economy. And we did stress tests where we looked at, so you know, what would happen if we did nothing? Um, we just sort of continued on as is. Uh, we looked at, well, what would happen if we just put all of this on the backs of our customers and rates, for example, or we just, the capital dial was the only one um, that we turned. And there were, there were a few conclusions that came out of this. And I think one of the things that's really important to understand is that the electric utility and the water utility from a financial perspective, are in different uh, situations. They have different conditions. For example, the electric utility, if we looked at a rates only solution uh, between now and 2023 would essentially double our rate trajectory that we had built in pre-COVID. We had some increases because of Carmen and, and Bonneville, but that would essentially double if we 
put that only on the backs of our customers. And you contrast that, for example, then with the rates only approach with water and it moves from you know 3% to 5%. So it's it's a little less sensitive probably on the water side relative to both consumption, um, but also the rates impact of, of doing a rates only approach. Now we also looked at, at borrowing capacity um, you know, one of the questions is, well, you know, what happens if you just borrow your way through this because you're making long term decisions? Um, there's not a lot of headroom with the present rate um, trajectory or plans that we have on the electric side. Uh, we have some reserves, but there's not a lot of headroom to borrow more without a rate impact. And you will see when we start talking about long term financial plans and capital plans where we're looking at what would happen if we increased the capital planning by $100 million, for example? And so uh, we think that's possible and in fact may be necessary. Um, and there's, but there is some rate impact and that's in the outer years. And so we looked at, so that, you know, we can, we can kind of summarize that up. And if you compare that with the water utility, the water utility based on how it operates, the fact that it borrows uh, for these long-term investments anyway, and those are kind of built into the rates already in a little different way. There's a lot of headroom on the water side. Um, I don't want to say, it's, I said it's almost unconstrained. So there's a lot of, of borrowing capacity on the water side. So very little on the electric, a lot on the water. And then pretty similar on the rates, you know, and the rates um, were kind of mid-pack uh, in the electric utility, and you'll see that with specific numbers. Whereas the water utility, we do have what, what I would term as rates headroom um, based on the, um, the fact that we're the second lowest in the region from a water rates perspective. And so I just wanted to give you a little context before we start talking a lot about numbers. Um, and one example I'll just give you, next slide please, um, is that when we looked, and, and really you don't even have to look at the numbers, you just look at the colors. This is the no an example of the no mitigation modeling that we did. The electric utility um, yellow, by the way, through this presentation means that we're within 10% of our board uh, minimum policy. And uh, in this case, the orange or reddish color means that we have violated that. So we've gone beyond policy, we've, um, in, which uh, has a lot of impl implications. And so you can see the electric utility without mitigation. There's a lot of red starting next year, uh, pretty much going all the way through the 10 year view with a lot of other metrics that are just kind of on the edge, whereas the water utility under no mitigation um, has one year in the in really the outer years where there's a violation of our of our metrics. And so this we did this for a number of scenarios. This is just one I wanted to share just to give you a feel for what what we've done. Um, to look at some of these stress tests. And so with that context in mind and that kind of that uh, foundation, I think I'll turn it back to either Deborah or, or Adam. I'm not sure who's picking it up from here to run through the specifics of the long term financial planning scenarios that we came up with based on what we thought were the most likely uh, scenarios uh, and assumptions going forward. So. We've explored the boundaries and now we're going to bring it back into what we think uh, the board should be uh, thinking about as far as details. I think Deborah, back to you. Deborah, I think you're on mute. I was, sorry. <laughs> uh, before we launched into a discussion on 2021, I did want to uh, just take a moment to make sure that we were caught up on where we were here to date. As Frank had mentioned, the water utility hasn't seen um, a drop off below budget in consumption yet. It's, it got off to a very strong start of the year. However, June consumption was the lowest that it had been in years. Still above budget, but lower. And we are coming into our heavier consumption months and that trend uh, may change either through weather or our customers considering their irrigation usage. Uh, the electric utility is definitely a different story. Um, warm temperatures earlier in the year and the loss of a major customer already put pressure on the utility even before COVID. 
Um, so in addition to those stressors, we are seeing that four, that 4% 4 load loss that Frank mentioned. We are monitoring uh, the industry analysts. We are looking back at the last recession, our unemployment figures. And that really tells us that this is consistent with the economic conditions that we're experiencing right now. Uh, so in addition to the decline in consumption, past due balances do remain high. We spent a lot of time on that. So uh, I'm just gonna say that we are watching it really closely. And I had um, hot off the presses numbers that Frank didn't have. We have about 600 payment plans in, in, the, in the pipeline right now uh, of those customers who are uh, very past due. So that's been really good work. And our customers have been really appreciative. The customers who answer our calls are really appreciative of an option for them to help dig out of that hole. So, hey Deborah, I'm mm -hmm. sorry to sorry to interrupt. I just um, for the record and for commissioners, I just uh, some of you may or may not just got a text from Sonia Carlson. Uh, apparently, she is texting that was told that her building is on fire and she was asked to evacuate. And so, um, hopefully, everything is is okay with her. But I think she may have dropped off the meeting uh, because of that. And so. Um, Vice President Schlossberg, I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Um, I didn't know if you got that um, hot. That's really literally hot off the press um, information. So Deborah, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to, to make sure that commissioners were aware uh, of why Commissioner Carlson dropped off the call. Well, timing was good. I was just about ready to pass it off to Adam if we could get the next slide. Uh, thanks, Deborah. So this, uh, Frank alluded to our position relative to other utilities uh, in his slide, and uh, this chart demonstrates where we are currently relative to the peer utilities for the combined water and electric. Uh, the backgrounder had the individual utilities, so we just wanted to uh, present this one to demonstrate that we're in the same position as last year when you saw this as uh, six lowest for the combined utility. Um, we're second lowest for the water and then closer to the middle of the pack at eighth lowest for the electric utility as standalone. Um, a big driver for this position has been the, uh, coming on the fifth year of no rate increase uh, that we're looking towards in 2021. Next slide, please. Um, so we, we have talked about the uh, revenue reduction assumptions we've included. So we have the 5% in 2020 and 2021 that's been mentioned that's uh, consistent with the, what we've seen so far. Uh, we have assumed reductions in 2023 and 2024 as well. So some of the cost reductions that we've um, been mitigating the lost revenue include um, lower inflation assumptions for both labor and non-labor costs as well as uh, reductions in travel and training budgets throughout the plan. Um, and we'll be, we've incorporated the capital uh, improvement plans that Rod will be talking about later in the next presentation. So those are incorporated in these financial plans as well. So next slide, please, thanks. Um, so we have included uh, several scenarios for either utility. So I'll spend a little bit more time in the first uh, slide here, but there'll be three for water or three for electric and then three for water um, going through the assumptions. But just to provide the context in the, the first slide here, the board target for the uh, cash and reserve balances is represented in the green uh, kind of background on the chart. Uh, the uh, bars represent our projected our projected cash balances, so you can see we're above target within each of the years. Uh, as Frank mentioned, in the yellow on the um, top line in the in the middle table is where you can see we're approaching target. Uh, debt service coverage is the red line, and you can see that's really the constraining factor throughout the plan in terms of our cash flows and borrowing. Um, so we're approaching that uh, throughout the plan in the near term and the long term. The rate trajectory that's uh, incorporated is consistent with what you saw last year. So the only rate increase that's uh, included is really when we picked up the 10th year being um, what's an assumed Bonneville uh, uh, rate increase where we model every other year the 6% Bonneville that corresponds with 2.5% for um, eWeb customers. So other than that, the rate trajectory is uh, very 
consistent with what you saw last October. Um, it's very uncertain that 2030, since that'll be a new contract year, but we've just continued to model that assumption until we have more information. Um, in addition to the 5% load loss we have for uh, uh, for our commercial or for our residential and commercial customers, we've also assumed a reduction in or the the loss of Arauco that uh, Frank alluded to earlier. So that's incorporated in the, in the plan as well. Um, and for in terms of resources, this does include um, the Lieberg outage throughout 2021, which was discussed at last month's board meeting. So we've assumed no generation in that facility throughout the um, 2021 until we have more information uh, on that project. Um, so next slide, please. So the, this is a, what we've characterizing as the constrained scenario, which is a $25 million reduction in capital. Uh, Rod's presentation will go into more detail of what that looks like in terms of trade-offs for uh, reliability and, and other factors in the, in the capital planning progress process. But um, for financial planning, you can uh, see that that does provide a little bit um, of additional headroom in the metrics in the in the out years um, where those reductions are occurring. Um, but the plan looks uh, relatively consistent um, and has some different borrowing and, and reserve utilization assumptions. But for the most part, the other assumptions are the same as the um, as the as plan scenario. So next slide, please. Uh, so this is the expanded capital scenario. This one is assuming an additional hundred million dollar in capital expenditure. Um, Rod will talk more about what that would look like in terms of capital planning and uh, uh, capital investment decisions, um, but this plan includes a significantly higher borrowing, so you can see more pressure on debt service coverage. Um, we've also incorporated higher rate increases, so we've, in order to support the higher capital spending, we've assumed uh, roughly three and a half percent increase in the rate trajectory to manage the higher capital spending. Um, but the other uh, revenue and cost assumptions are consistent with the uh, prior versions of the plan. Uh, so moving to the water utility, um, as Frank mentioned, the circumstances are a bit different for the water utility as the electric utility. Um, you can see in the 2024 to 2027 timeframe is where we show a drawdown for funding that the current plan for the uh, or the current assumption for the second source treatment plant. Um, that brings us to the one year where we're approaching target in 2027 as we fund that uh, that treatment plant. Um, the rate trajectory is uh, consistent with what you uh, saw last year. It's a, a little bit of a change in terms of we moved up some borrowing that we had seized on an opportunity of historic low uh, interest rates to borrow in 2020 and reduce the 2024 borrowing. So that's a, a change in the assumptions. Uh, moving to the next slide. So this slide is um, a the constrained scenario with the reduced capital of uh, $55 million uh, second source treatment plant. Um, so with this scenario, you can see we're um, adding cash well above target. And we've also reduced the rate trajectory um, this to um, maintain uh, close to the targets, but you can see we're well above debt service coverage and cash reserves targets in this scenario. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so the expanded capital scenario is an additional uh, $50 million um, in capital funding for the second uh, source. Um, this includes um, higher capital borrowing, and you can see in this scenario, the water utility does approach those debt service coverage metrics um, and is challenged in that way. And it additionally includes a, a roughly 3% rate increase in the rate trajectory. So higher borrowing, higher um, rates to fund that second source treatment plant. Um, so after going through those scenarios, uh, uh, the next slide, um, just go into the next steps a little bit. So our budgeting uh, process really gets kicked off with this board meeting tonight. So we'll take any direction that's incorporated in the capital plans or any financial plan assumptions and we'll start uh, the budgeting process tomorrow uh, where we'll make any of those changes into our worksheets and, and um, the solicit feedback from uh, throughout the organization to make sure that um, those get completed throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, uh, the budget is completed kind of um, 
in parallel to some extent with the cost of service analysis, which will be informing any rate decisions. So uh, into the fall, we'll be finalizing the budget and preparing cost of service analysis. In October, we'll be bringing back an updated long-term financial plan, uh, incorporating the budget, have a draft budget and um, preliminary cost of service results. Um, the November and December meetings will be formal public hearings and ultimately December will um, look to have a, seek approval for the budget and any uh, recommended changes in rates. So that's the last slide for us, I think. Thanks. All right, All right. we can open it up for questions or comments. And um, if we go in alphabetical order, we'll start with you, John. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, Deborah and Adam. That's very good. Uh, just a couple of questions, mostly on attachment one, uh, but uh, one of them is your full year labor generation outage in 2021. So are you assuming we're going back on in 2022? That's the current assumption that we have modeled here in the plans. Okay. Do we know what impact just uh, approximately if we don't go back? What does that do to some of your metrics if we don't generate in 2022? Lieber doesn't come back? Um, so I think an extension into 2022, there still um, seems to be some headroom in there. I think it'll be a, probably a bigger issue for the metrics as we go into 2023, um, where we're um, uh, challenged again, but um, we'll be incorporating those and presumably um, by the October board meeting when we bring back the financial plans, hopefully we'll have more information on uh, the duration, but the most recent information that we have was an extension through 2021. Okay, thanks. A couple more. Yeah, um, Commissioner Brown, I sure. would I would just add just for context, you know, you, you look at the numbers here and, and um, Lieberg by itself, when you separate it out from Walterville, uh, the revenue generated from Liebberg is probably in the the two to two and a half million dollars a year range. Not all of that is margin, um, but that's revenue, which you know is it, it's slightly impactful, but I don't know that it changes the the overall conclusion that the electric utility is probably tight. Um, but there also is the ability to, with some rate adjustments in the outer years, look at future investments. Um, we are also contemplating, as part of our financial planning, the investments needed uh, potentially that we will talk to the board about later this fall around, you know, what levels of investment does Lieber need, um, which could be significant. So both of those are going to be part of our process as we go through the next few months. But just just so we you know, Lieberg is a big chunk of that. OK, and real, to a couple other quick ones using uh, 19 and a half million of the rate stabilization fund. What's the total balance in that fund right now? Are we wiping it out? That would uh, that would bring us down to target in that fund. Well, OK, what's that? It's Five million. So Basically, we've got we're using 19 and a half million and we would take it down to five. Yes. And so, that yeah, go ahead. Uh, and that uh, and that's consistent with uh, with we had initially deposited 20 million in there to reduce future borrowing. So yes. that's actually the action that we're taking there. Okay. And then last question, I noticed that we're going to start a million dollars a year to the meter replacement reserve fund in 2021 for electric, but we don't start until 2024 for water. Why the difference? The water meters have a little bit longer life and what we're trying to uh, avoid there is that lump in the snake where we need to replace a bunch of meters at once and have that reserve available to fund those. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good answers. All right, Commissioner Helgeson, have any questions? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I just want to appreciate our process. I mean, this is um, developed and matured over the time that I've been on the board. And, you know, I think we're in a position now where you're bringing us consistent information that doesn't um, vary wildly from presentation to presentation. And, and we're working along a, a trajectory that's understood and leads to and through, as Adam indicated, our, our budget process. 
Um, I just want to point out that um, even without COVID issues or Lieberg issues or other uncertainties that are beginning to impinge on us, we've anticipated that there would come a time not too distant future um, when rate actions would be necessary in order to sort of normalize our rate trajectory and that the actions that have been taken um, and, and uh, very diligently over the last several years um, to restructure our debt and to contain uh, our, our, our staffing and, and our internal costs um, are not things that will allow us to defer rate increases forever. So, you know, we're faced with some uncertainties now that make that potential problem even more acute. So I just want to say, first of all, that while I recognize and, and appreciate that avoidance of a rate increase next year is probably an appropriate um, consideration, that I don't want to see us dig ourselves a hole or develop some kind of bow wave that becomes a difficult problem for uh, the new board, I'll call it, uh, as as we uh, as people take up their their new terms. Uh, I guess I won't be here to worry about it, but I just know historically that there have been times when we've deferred rate actions to the last possible moment, and then combined with some untoward, unknown event that conspires against us, the rate actions come off as being precipitous or larger than anticipated. So I just I just want to make sure that we're not so reticent to play the rate card looking forward that that we dig ourselves a hole or create a, a bow wave or a, 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 a large increase um, all of a sudden when otherwise we, we've held off for six or seven years. I also want to say that the levers we have to reach to in order to manage a situation like this, obviously you can deal with rates. You can borrow more money, but I would say that when we're in a situation where additional borrowing just um, drives the rates up because of our debt sub service coverage requirements, that suggests to me that maybe we're potentially close to um, being leveraged as much as we can be because you want to avoid a situation where the, the debt service coverage is driving your, your rate equation. I think we can cut costs, but that's a long-term efficiency play that you work year in and year out and you can't do things that are precipitous uh, Maybe you can do that temporarily, but not to solve problems that uh, go forward. So you can defer capital, but that too has consequences. And you can draw to some extent on reserves, um, but reserves are not inexhaustible. And um, you know the relief they provide with respect to ongoing costs like BPA rate increases is, is only temporary. So I just want to caution that we not, you know, get so used to keeping the rates at the same level that we buy ourselves a problem um, down the road um, of significant proportions that's exacerbated by some of the uncertainties that are coming to the fore. So thanks for that opportunity. Okay, I don't know if there was a question in there that you wanted responded to or just or that was just your thoughts, but I'll no, I think the staff presentation is clear and I understand what was provided and kind of what we're looking at in terms of um, contingencies. I just um, I'm concerned that um, we, we just not push off any rate action to the point where um, that, that creates problems um, either with customers or in terms of maintaining the financial health of the organization and that those were more comments. Right. Thank you. Um, so I have a comment that kind of piggybacks on what Dick has just said, and I, I understand that um, uh, the need to make sure that we are, um, that we don't push off any rate increases or anything like that. The thing that just comes to mind to me is when you gave the presentation, you talked about where we are, um, where our rates are compared to um, other people in the region. But I think in one of our background things you looked at more of like what the energy burden was based on what we pay compared to the average salary here the average income here and it just looks a little different just because our income our average income here is lower than some of our comparators and um so that that just causes me a little bit of concern if we are going into a recession that um 
just looking at the energy burden that we have versus just the raw rate, um, comparing rates across the region. So it's just something that's on my mind. Um, and then I do have a question. I'm just wondering, is there any talk of any kind of like um, recovery funds or any anything from the federal government or the state government that might help help us out? I know that a lot of money is going into PPP loans or unemployment, but I'm wondering if at, for utilities, is there any talk of any kind of help? Uh, so, Frank, you had your hand up. <laughs> Oh, I was I was going to address a couple of things um, when it was when it was my turn. I think that um, there is some movement uh, at the federal level to look at programs that would aid utilities. It it comes with some strings attached to it. For example, they're talking about if you were to get a grant or a loan from the federal government as a utility you would have to agree to not do disconnects, for example, and some other things. So there's, there are some strings attached. Um, that is um, not, that has not been approved at this point. Um, there's also some infrastructure act work taking place. So that would actually help an eWeb potentially because of the, the heavy investment that we make in infrastructure. So, um, not not a lot of direct aid. Um, they did. Um, uh, the state of Oregon did increase aid for the electric customers. Um, they did not do that for the water side. However, some of that is because there are hundreds of water utilities <laughs> because of you know every little utility can become a, a, a water supplier can by default become a utility. So. Um, we're keeping an eye on that. Um, most of it may come through infrastructure funding as opposed to just crisis aid. And if it does come through crisis aid, it's going to have some some uh, burden that is associated with it. Your your other comment, uh, Commissioner Schlossberg, around the so I I really agree um, with both you and uh, Commissioner uh, Helgeson when it comes to to looking at the different levers, um, you know, the the rates is is one of the tools. Reserves is one of the tools. You know, you look at spending, you look at costs. You you know, you try to look at all that in in balance and context. Um, we we specifically look at the utility burden um, just for context. It's not a tool by itself, but we we want to remind ourselves of the condition of our customers in this area. Uh, we are we are not Bellevue. Uh, I think going back to Commissioner Brown's comments from a number of years ago, uh, comparing us directly with Bellevue, where income is is uh, tens of thousands of dollars higher, is is maybe not a, a very relative comparator. And so, it partly it's about the rates directly. Part of it is about understanding our community. We we do know that there's some challenges um, from a family income perspective. So we use that just to keep our mind in the right place um, and our decisions in the right place. But I, I do agree with Commissioner Helgeson that all the levers need to be looked at in concert. Uh, and in fact, when you look at both the water and the electric long term um, uh, financial plans, they have you know roughly 21 or so percent increases over the next decade which you know comes back to a couple percent or so that's pretty much in line with inflation and so i think that was previous direction from the board was to keep rates within inflation and as well so um absolutely agree we've got to look at all of these imbalance and one thing that we didn't mention in our planning is we're not just looking at the cost side. I think it's also really appropriate to look at the revenue side as we go forward. Now we haven't baked a lot of those numbers in because when you think about electrification, um, there's some potential increases in consumption and load and therefore revenue. Those will tend to be a little bit more longer term or require incentives either from the state or the federal government or eWeb. So we are recognizing that those who say you know you have to look at the revenue side as well we we agree with that we just haven't baked that in um, to some substantial perspective to a substantial point yet so deborah sorry were you gonna add some comments in there did i, I 
steal those? <laughs> uh, I think for the most part, you hit them. There's not a lot of direct aid out there. We are keeping an eye on the possibility of a, of a, a loan program for working cash. However, uh, it does not appear that we'll need it at this point. Uh, some folks have done some good work in getting reimbursed for PPE uh, expenditures, uh, but otherwise uh, Frank covered it. Okay, so did you get what you needed from us? I uh, believe so. We'll uh, want to hear the capital discussion and what comes out of that. Yeah, okay. I believe John Brown had a had a comment or question. Yeah. Thank you. I, it's following up with uh, the discussions talked about, you know, the push and kicking the can down the road and then having a significant rate increase of four and a quarter percent in year after next. Um, what What's it going to take to see if we decided that we wanted to see what the long term plan looked like if we raised rates uh, one or two percent next year and uh, what that would do to these projections uh, just to have that information at the next meeting so we could consider that because to go nothing in 2021 and then four and a quarter, two and a half, four and a half, you know, and all those increases, um, you know, to, to Dick's point is to kind of soften this a little bit. If we haven't had a rate in five years, um, it, is that anything that anybody else wants to see um, to kind of soften it? Because otherwise uh, they're going to be pretty significant raise, raises coming up. Yeah, Co Commissioner Brown, I would say we can run a number of different models. Uh, smoothing can be part of that. Um, I'm not sure I would classify 4% as a as a large increase, but um, you know, looking at two and two instead, there there is a little bit of financial pressure on the electric side in in 2021 and 22 as as we kind of get into some of those metrics. But so we we can slide that around um, as we go through the next. Um, few months and see how much difference that's going to make. Um, what, what we've kind of found the last several years is as we approach the year, we we have found that our conservative assumptions work out pretty well. And so, um, you know, it may not be four and a quarter. It might might end up being three and a half or, you know, it has tended to, to slide down rather than up. Um, but we can run those scenarios. We we can look at a some some early rate increase to smooth that. Yeah, and then just to follow up and then to build that rate stabilization fund back up. We started with five million. We have apparently twenty five million in the bank there now. Is that correct, Deborah? That is. Okay, and so it kind of it looks like we're depleting it all in in for to to keep no rate increases next year. And uh, I would kind of like to think about building that back up because we're using, you know, we've been saving that for five years and we're using it all in one year. It seems like we're, you know, if, if our goal was $5 million a year and we're, we're using 20 million of it and we have 25, that's a significant uh, chunk of money for one year and then we raise rates. I'm just wondering how yeah. we're going to get that back up. Yeah, the com Commissioner Brown, the, the, you know, we're not using that money because of sort of normal business that was set aside specifically for Carmen. And so to offset borrowing for for the the lump in the oatmeal that is Carmen. And so if if there are larger lumps in the oatmeal that we need to be saving for, I think that would probably make sense. Um, but that had a very particular, you know, we, we actually made deposits in that for specific reasons, and that was for, to offset borrowing for Carmen. And so that, you know, we, we can build that back. We, we can establish a level that, of comfort that the board um, wants to establish there. Um, but just just that that was built up for a specific reason. We're using the money for those reasons. And so that's why it's going back down to the, what the original board board target was. Okay, thank you. All right. Dick, you get one more round. Just um, quickly following up on Commissioner Brown's um, comments and questions. Um, so I, I understood, Frank, from what you said then that that the use of the rate um, stability reserve funds as um, anticipated for next year is directed towards reducing what would otherwise be a larger 
uh, debt issuance for Carmen Smith purposes? Yeah, that as was the original intent to, for that deposit, yeah. Well, I know that was the original intent, but but is that, in fact, what we're using that money for, such that our debt issuance is lower than it would otherwise been, which is consistent with that intent? Or as um, Commissioner Brown's earlier question suggested, are we using that money to cover um, groceries or and, and revenue requirement that otherwise would drive a rate increase? That is, uh, we the plan has that money going to capital, uh, not not buying groceries. To your point, we want to make sure that we cover our operating expenses with current revenues. Okay, well that's good uh, clarification. I just would comment that when you use reserves um, to um, cover um, ongoing costs, all you're doing is postponing a rate increase, not really avoiding one. So I would fully endorse um, the use of um, our rate stability reserve for avoiding um, what otherwise would be debt service in the future because that accrues to a rate benefit year in and year out. Whereas um, if we were using that money simply to cover some of our higher costs that otherwise um, would drive a rate increase next year, um, that's just it, at best a temporary measure. So I, I would be interested, um, like Commissioner Brown, in, in seeing at least some scenarios that would involve um, a, a, a modest increase next year. I don't mean that to be that that's what I'm suggesting we do, but I, I don't think 4.5% is outrageous either, but I think if we're moving from a place of having had no increases for an extended period of time to having a series of what people perceive to be sizable increases year in and year out for a while, that that's a tough road for a future board. And in the third year, it all comes home to roost in my experience. Thanks, I'm, I'm done. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. We actually got Commissioner Helgeson and, and um, the, the, the comment you made about the use of reserves is absolutely the way we view it. Reserves are there for a specific purpose to cover something that is either intentionally preordained or um, a one-time event. You, we do not believe that you use reserves for ongoing expenses or capital that would otherwise be funded in a different way. That, that is absolutely what we agree with. So thank you for stating it so, so eloquent, eloquently. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Um, we are, it is 6.52 and we are almost exactly on our uh, timeline for our agenda and we are slated to have a five minute break. So we are going to take a break and we will come back at 6.57 and I believe that Commissioner Carlson will rejoin us then. Hey Frank. Yeah, yeah, Dick. Um, it's not an issue, but I, uh, on my screen, I, I see. Hey, uh, hey, Commissioner Helgeson, I don't know if we're still live or not. We we may be, just so you know. That's okay. I'm I'm not going to tell any secrets. Okay. I I, uh, I see on my screen a little telephone and it says calling. Do Do you have that as well? Do you? I I do, and I don't know what that is. That that may be. It's obviously not creating a problem, so I'm not going to worry about it. I thought it was yeah, just. Yeah, I noticed that on mine as well. And I will, I, I don't know if Ann or Travis can answer that one. The good I will is, defer to Travis because I'm not seeing that in the producer view. Correct. It's not in the producer view. It may be uh, showing that there are call in attendees. We have at least 13 other attendees in there, um, but th it shouldn't affect what you're seeing or what you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's right in the middle of the screen above the control bar and um, it's pseudo transparent, just, just so you know, but it's, yeah, it's kind of right in the middle of the screen, but um, I, I, just, I was, I wasn't as curious as, as Dick, I figured it was just kind of there for a reason that I, I couldn't 
control anyway. So, uh, all right. Well, at least the good news is there's not an end button. That's true. <laughs> not for me anyway. And that's good news. Yes. <laughs> we'll take a look at getting that identified for you. Commissioner. Lena said it might be somebody's in the lobby. I don't know. Could Great. be. Yep. Thanks, Lena. All right, it's 657, but it does not look like the majority of people are back yet. So we'll give everyone another minute or so. Oh, here we are. And Sonia, are you back with us? Do we know? All right, I, I, I am back. Uh, Thanks for the indulgence there. That was a bit scary. Um, the, <laughs> the fireman banged on the door. I don't know if you saw me jump about a mile off my chair, um, but the fire is out. There's really not any damage. It was all external. Um, apparently somebody probably left a cigarette butt or something of that nature. Uh, I may have to jump in and out though, so I'm going to be on. Um, I'm going to turn my video off. I think the firemen are trying to get to me, so I'm going to be in and out, but I'm going to Try to be listening. OK, well, I'm glad that you're safe and that you're yeah. back. And yeah, take care, Sonia. OK, so we are going to readjourn and we are moving on to agenda item number nine, electric and water capital improvement plans. And I believe that we're going to turn it over to Rod Price. Yes, thank you. So um, good evening, commissioners. Um, Frank and I plan to wear the same shirt. Um, I'm not sure no, nobody else got the memo. Um, anyway, the, uh, we're here to talk about the the capital plan and some of the scenarios that that Frank has laid out. Um, basically, we're seeking some direction on uh, our, our recommendation as a staff to use the as planned uh, 10 year uh, SIP scenario. Uh, I wanted to do a quick shout out though to Wally and Tyler and the finance team. I went on vacation for a couple of weeks and uh, they've done a, a ton of work getting this uh, uh, planning together. Instead of doing one plan, we've we've been doing three plans and looking at them. So um, thank you to, to those folks. Wally and Tyler will actually uh, speak a few minutes and, and tell um, 
a little bit more about their side of the, the, the capital plan and what's in it. Tonight, though, I want to focus on the size of the pie. Uh, we've come to you in the past and talked a lot about pies and slices and sizes and, and all that. Um, one of the things that, that I'd like to do is, is talk about the size of the pie, how big uh, of a capital plan we have uh, and how that impacts uh, the finances and then also how it may impact reliability and um, you know, somewhat to, to Dick's point about pushing the snake down the road. So next slide, please. So Frank showed you his uh, view of the, the financial planning thing, and I'll, I'll just show you the, the rod engineer thing here about how I think about money and capital spending and, and how it fits in the big picture. And, you know, we have a mission and our mission is pretty simple. We deliver water and electricity reliably um, and, and we've got the strategic values of, of resiliency in there. And, and there's a whole bunch of things that go into that package and, and you're all familiar with that. Uh, to, to accomplish that, of course, we have income and, and that pays for reinvestment like capital and ongoing expenses, O&M, that kind of thing. So these are all interrelated and, and um, you know, you pull one, you kind of tug the other. And so it all kind of goes around in this circular loop. So uh, I'm going to speak about the, uh, the the three scenarios that, that were outlined by Deb and Adam a little bit uh, in these contexts. So next slide, please. So last time I talked to you about uh, we we can tweak the dial uh, last uh, about a month ago. Um, what I'm going to do is just kind of review real quick what the uh, capital plans look like in the different scenarios laid out by the financial folks. So the as plan is basically uh, last year's uh, plan that we presented both in, in magnitude and in basically in projects. Um, it one of the things that the is notable is is we have not included the the Liebberg Canal mitigation. Uh, we simply don't know enough about it, so it's not in the plan yet. And I believe Adam uh, did re uh, refer to that. Also, I'd like to point out we do have a placeholder in the the water plan for a second source, and and we talked about that a month ago as well. The placeholder we have there is enough to do a shared uh, venture with with another utility uh, or a very minimal second source for for eWeb alone. The constrained plan uh, is basically the as planned and, and it's a reduced um, uh, version of that. Uh, and that would be in response to, to economic pressures. Um, basically, what we would end up doing is, uh, again, we talked about this last month, deferring some resiliency and, and uh, uh, projects like modernization and automation and condition-based monitoring, uh, I'm sorry, condition-based replacements. Uh, but the goal is to maintain the reliability within our uh, uh, metrics and acceptable limits. Um, one of the key elements from especially the water plan is uh, to to reduce uh, and get to the constrained plan. We would move the second source completely out of the 10 year window. Um, the fun one here for me uh, is the expanded plan. Um, and, <laughs> And again, I'm, I'm throwing some English in here and some engineering. So if you see Deb pulling her hair in the background there, um, these are not financial terms and uh, precisions. So uh, bear with me. Uh, but basically, you know, how, how much can we go and reasonably remain afford affordable? Um, and so Frank laid out some scenarios. Uh, and this is a, a, a bookend to sort of look at, you know, what are the impacts if we if we do spend more? Uh, and if we do, then then that allows the electric uh, capital plan to start uh, attacking our age of system and getting our condition-based uh, uh, type one uh, cross arm kind of replacements, uh, pole replacements, all these things in, in full function. It also leaves a lot of room for uh, uh, leave the, the canal mitigation um, and, and we won't know more about that until later in the year or, or perhaps in another year or so. But also, there's some room for, for electrification. So there's the, the expanded plan uh, uh, lines out some, some headroom for us to work with. Uh, in the um, water plan, what it does is it brings the, uh, the uh, second source back within the 10 year window with a full uh, amount to uh, uh, fund a, uh, a full sized uh, treatment plan and all the uh, transmission and everything that would go along with that. Next slide, please. 
so uh, just kind of a spoiler alert here. Um, the part of the purpose of looking at those plans is to to review the the impact on on rates in the future. So what I'm going to do is go through the three plans here and uh, kind of line them up with my model a little bit. But uh, starting with electric, you'll see that uh, the capital plans around 335 million. Um, uh, we maintain reliability. Um, our age assistance stays about the same. Resiliency is um, projects are in the same ballpark. Um, I put a little bullet in there. The the green it says rate impact is zero. Um, so basically, the there there is a rate trajectory. Both Frank and and Deb and and Adam have covered. There's a planned rate trajectory. Uh, this uh, does not add or subtract from that planned rate subject um, trajectory. In the water department, we're looking at about 244 million. Um, again, maintaining reliability. Uh, it'll slightly chew into our age of system. Um, and uh, and and give us some resiliency from our second source perspective. And again, no rate changes. Next slide, please. So this is a constraint scenario. Basically, it's the reduced uh, reduction from the as plan. So uh, in the uh, electric, um, that's about a $25 million reduction over a 10 year period. Um, more, our estimates are showing that we will start to uh, drop our reliability probably below our five year averages because we're not able to keep up with with all the things going wrong. Right now we're really focusing on um, our big ticket items like transformers, um, power transformers, substations, main points of contact. Um, and we have uh, 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 Tyler can probably tell you a little bit more about that when, when we get there. So. Uh, one of the things that will be stressed, though, is our age of system metric will be pushing 60% or, or greater um, due to the, the investments not keeping up with the, with the depreciation. And of course, our resiliency will be reduced because we'll have to cut some of the resilient projects. So uh, the rate impact on this is um, it's no change, and I suspect you would have to talk to Deb and Adam for the exact details of why this is. But uh, basically, the idea is we're we're uh, cutting expenses in the um, uh, as planned scenarios and not touching the the um, uh, capital plan. And, and so as the economic pressures come in, then the capital plan is reduced as well. So uh, and that maintains the, the rate trajectories. Um, in the water department, though, um, the capital plan drops significantly from 244 to 191. Um, Basically, we were still able to hit our master plan and keep our reliability uh, intact, but our age of system will um, uh, uh, stay, um, pro probably raise a little bit, but it's still well within targets. Um, and the real kicker here is that we'll lose that second source, and so that significantly hits our resiliency. What is the cost of that or the savings? Uh, basically, it's uh, at the end of 10 years, we'll be saving about a dollar a month on a typical utility bill. Thank, thank you. Uh, the expanded scenario. Um, so we went in the, the electric, we jumped from 320 to uh, 435. Um, that's enough uh, money and headroom to to cover Lieberg mitigation. We we suspect and and even some electrification kind of things. It would also help us push the um, uh, the focus on the the electric and generation plant to about 360 um, 360 million, which will help us chew into the age of system and um, increase our uh, and maintain our reliability. In the water side, in, well, that in, in the estimates are that would add about six dollars per month to the electric uh, bill at the end of ten years. In the water side, um, we would add what is that? We go from two forty four, so it's about fifty million dollars add, uh, bringing back in the second source. Uh, obviously, reliability will be enhanced with multiple sources and flexibility and switching um, sources around and transmission lines, etc. Age of system will go down because of the investment. Um, but the kicker again is our resiliency will be uh, greatly enhanced, and, and um, this is fully in the, the the master plan. 
the rate impact of that we expect to be about a dollar a month more after 10 years. So I'm going to turn it over to Tyler and he's, or I'm sorry, Wally, uh, and he's going to talk a little bit about the uh, contents, the secret sauce in the pie. Okay, thanks, Rod. Good evening, commissioners. I just wanted to kind of give a quick overview of what's in the, uh, well, the water pie um, for the 10 year CIP and just kind of go over each of the categories. Um, let's start with the compulsory work. Those, that's all the work that we really need to do. We can't really push it out or don't have a lot of flexibility with that. That's about 20% of our 10 year CIP. The bulk of that is all really our service and development work driven by our customers. Um, it also includes our um, main replacements that are dictated and driven by the city street rebuilds that, um, that occur all around town, you see those. Um, an example of this, one of these projects is the um, East 19th main replacement that was in the consent calendar tonight, was a compulsory main replacement driven by a city street um, rebuild program. In the 10 years, we've also put in for compulsory our first base level reservoir as it's needed to really take out of service the College Hill Reservoir, which is driven by regulatory issues. And a new reservoir would be at the East 40th site. Um, the board should see a uh, contract for design of that um, new reservoir in the consent item in the August board meeting with completion of construction in early 2023 for that project. Kind of going down into the next category, which would be our strategic work. That's about 30% of our 10 year CIP. It starts with uh, kind of wrapping up the AMI program over the next three, but in the end of 2023, we have that being wrapped up. A few years behind electric, kind of taking a little bit slower approach there. Um, it includes our emergency water stations, the distributed sites that we're establishing around town. Um, the consent calendar, again, it had the South Eugene Wells was part of the South Eugene Water Distribution Emergency Water Site. It was approved tonight, so we're anxious to see how that goes. And moving on from south, we'll be just keeping working around Eugene, probably heading to Churchill next and then make another loop around the periphery of our um, service territory. As Rod mentioned, the strategic category also meant includes kind of a placeholder for a a second water treatment plant. And as you mentioned, this could, the amount that's included in our CIP could be a fairly robust plant if there was some contributions from another utility sub or a more of a much more scaled back plant if this had to be eWeb only funded. The bulk of the, um, well, about a little over 50% of the 10 year CIP is our risk based work. Um, there's a lot of things that go into this. It's a, a tremendous number of small projects that are in our risk space. And they're kind of overshadowed, overshadowed by the large reservoir and transmission projects. An example of some of the small projects they included in our risk based work would be the um, VFD replacements that was also on the consent calendar tonight for water. Um, that would be a risk based project. We have some variable frequency drives that turn the motors and our pumps that are at our um, Hayden Bridge filtration plant that now is the right time. They're not haven't failed yet, but the resources and timing just worked out right. So they fit into our capital plan currently. So it's just an example of one of those small projects. For risk based. Um, the large projects include the replacement of our base level reservoirs at College Hill, Hawkins, and at Santa Clara eventually. And it also includes numerous large transmission pipeline um, projects to kind of interconnect those reservoirs as we're building our kind of um, distributed storage approach that we've talked to the board about. Our first phase of our first transmission pipeline is in construction currently. Um, going across the headquarters site that we coordinated with the city as part of with their infrastructure upgrade and that will be going on for the next several years. Just that one project. So anyway, it's kind of a quick summary of what's in the as planned CIP for the next 10 years for water and I'll turn it over to Tyler to 
to uh, review the electric. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for the time. Uh, record, I'm Tyler Nice, electric division manager. So kind of tail on with what Wally talked about with the pie for electric. We have the same categories and they're and they're roughly the same components, you know, about a little less than half of that risk based um, and the compulsory and strategic between 25, 30% for each of those. Uh, sorry, I don't know if you can hear that, but sounds like the neighbors getting rid of some extra fireworks. So apologize if you're any popping in the background. Uh, but really the overall principle that's kind of guiding each one of these scenarios, but talking about the as plan specifically is, is a focus on infrastructure replacement to maintain reliability. Under this plan, the as plan, which is basically a copy and paste of last year's funding. Uh, well, what we're seeing is that this is in a maintaining reliability mode, but it is slightly declining. And there's a couple things I mentioned, I'll mention in here that, that are indicators of that. Uh, and, and really that's focused on trying to limit the larger outages that we have. So uh, of our Sadie and Safi uh, reliability indexes for the last couple of years, uh, around 15, 20% of the makeup of those has been from, you know, a few number of uh, large substation outages. And th those outages usually run two to three hours to restore if everything uh, is, is uh, easily switchable, but they may have three to 5,000 people on, on a substation. So we're really focusing on trying to maintain those large replacements uh, of those substations since they're a real key player in those, in those metrics. Going down the list here, uh, emergent repair, we kind of have historical numbers that we build into the budget for for that kind of equipment that, that fails that we need to replace throughout the year. Customer work surprisingly has been actually up uh, this year and it's been kind of maintaining and we don't know if that's a bubble or if that'll fall off as COVID progresses and the economy experiences pressures or if that'll maintain, but but for a, a while that has been staying very steady. So we're, we're still counting on that, no, no change in that in the plan. Uh, on the compliance and PUC for the electric side and on the generation side for compliance, those are both programs that we're really focused on, really driven towards and for safety and reliability and, and compliance, frankly. And uh, we're really focused on keeping those programs intact. So those are still fully funded. I know we've done a lot of work on both of those in the recent history. On the strategic, AMI is still a uh, plan for a 2021 uh, completion deployment. Uh, some of the uh, more three phase or more complicated metering setups may will bleed over a little bit, but the residential is still shooting for that to, to reach the benefit. Um, that's able to move forward. One of the big hurdles was communication and with partnership with the city with uh, at your level and with Rod and Frank involved, we're able to move some hurdles uh, to get some of those towers installed. So we're moving on that. That's that's a really good sign. So that's still modeled. Uh, also, we are we are still uh, upriver resiliency and reconfiguration. That's our upriver plan we've talked to you about. It has to do with the resilient spine, uh, bringing power uh, in a large outage, either from from uh, BPA, Black Start, or from upriver. Now, parts of this plan are are on hold right now with the Lieberg decision in the canal being up in the air. But there's other parts we are working on. Thurston substation and Curran, the main ones that that involves some bolstering to upriver reliability, but also some ties within the system. We do in the later years have some load growth planning, mainly focused in West Eugene. That would be some uh, transmission line additions and substation upgrades for future load based on historical knowledge and, and what we know of coming up with urban growth boundary or possible load expansion. And then of course, Carmen, that, that one is uh, slightly delayed this year with the, the larger generator work. Uh, happening early in the year next year, uh, but there is some work happening this year that's going to take it take its place kind of more on the controls, uh, the brain side of the generators, and then of course all the work continuing on in the plan going forward with fish mitigation and also uh, just the other powerhouse work. And on the risk based front, like I said, we're really focused on those larger outages and so we're trying to hone our asset strategies to that. Uh, you know, since we're talking metaphors and we talked about lumps in the oatmeal or lumps in the snake, you know, another one's a pig in a python. And, you know, when we talk about our transformers right now, that's like a piglet, you know, it's a, it's a manageable problem, but we have started to see in the last two years, failures at three of our substations of the large power transformers, the big ones, when you drive by, you see, 
and those are equipment that's kind of in that six to nine month lead time that in the in certain substations and situations would be a really bad uh, issue that that we want to mitigate. So we are putting some upfront money into a mitigation plan that involves bolstering some of the spares ahead of time to make us a little more nimble for those replacements. And underground replacement plan uh, cable, we talked about that, uh, I think in uh, October, November last year, about a plan to focus on underground feeder because that age, that asset is, is aging and, and that's still, it's reduced a bit in this plan is what we planned, but, but it's still in there in some resemblance. And then our normal distribution renewal and replacement, uh, that's our poles and wires and transformers that, that we roll over and try to keep up on. And that ties a little bit with the PUC work, but uh, that, that's kind of the look at electric and our focus. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll speak a little bit about the support services side. And kind of the focus on support services, the, the big rock, if you will, and this one is Rod uh, put in this, this uh, photo here that says, pipes and wires are the least effective way to connect with this generation of rate payers. And that's really in that focusing on that strategic portion of the uh, pie first, uh, that, that's really the focus of that. You know, we may not compete in the, on the power and water sense directly with, with any other utilities in Eugene, but the customer experience, we're competing every day with their experience with other companies. And so we do have built into that support side through IS and, and, uh, and also other support services to be able to provide a similar experience. So that's where the AMI and the CEI and the CIS come into play. And, uh, and going back to the other categories, you know, the, there's still the day-to-day -day work that, that, that we can't afford to trim out because it, it is the backbone of keeping our, our uh, system running from behind the scenes, which is our IT network and, and systems there. Also, uh, fleet, which keeps our uh, employees and staff out there working and restoring outages. We need to keep that funded. And uh, also looking forward down to the risk base, talking about systems for asset management and also streamlining our operations with uh, kind of our Metro E and, and uh, control system out there into a, a wider area network. And so working on all those things, a lot of those are more of the same in the plans. Uh, some of them a little bit uh, reduced, but still that focus on the larger infrastructure and some of these larger strategic efforts that are customer focused. So with that, I'll hand it over to Rod. Might be on mute still. Thanks, sir. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, so just a quick wrap up. Uh, basically, if for both uh, the water and, and electric capital plans, we're, we're just recommending we stick with the what we've planned uh, last year for, for this year. Um, with a couple notes, uh, we as we develop an understanding of the second source in the water uh, capital scenario, um, you know, I, I think it's nice to know that we've got plenty of uh, uh, capacity to uh, to go ahead and, and bring in um, different um, amounts to to address the the second sources as however we end up uh, doing that uh, with very little rate pressure oh I think Frank I heard Frank say I could borrow infinite money to spend so um, the the electric plan um, does have more of a top end and that's that that 450 but or whatever it was the the um, Right now, the as planned is is just enough to keep us going. Uh, I'd feel a lot more comfortable if we were in the 350 to 360 range to start uh, really chipping into the uh, age of system. And as Tyler was kind of talking about the the condition based monitoring kind of things, but and again, it shows that we uh, have been very financially resilient. Uh, we've got a great finance staff, just done a lot of work to get to this point where we can even talk about these options. I think it's fantastic. Um, and, and it gives us a, a lot of headroom in both plans um, to to maneuver as we need. But uh, for the time being, I think we're we're good with, uh, with the planned um, scenario. So with that, next slide, and I'd open it up to questions. If I've done my job right, you've got one minute to ask a question. Thank you, Rod, for that presentation. Um, the only commissioner that I can see is Dick, so I'm going to offer it up to you first if you want to if you have any questions or comments. I do think John's out there. Um, I was clicking around and I saw him, so John, are you out there? 
I'm still here. Oh, OK. Well, then why don't you go first? I I, um, I think Brown comes before Helgus. <laughs> I don't care. All right, well, thank you. I, a great presentation. I just do have a couple just a minutia questions about uh, these things. Uh, you know, I was involved when we built the rock and I see that we have some pretty significant expenditures that we're pushing down the road. Um, could you just tell me real quickly what's worn out there already? I mean, if if, if I'm out living buildings, that's a little scary, but uh, th th because I thought so, like the mechanical should have a 20 year life. And I thought we built that to seismic three, not essential service, but we built, didn't we build that uh, facility to uh, uh, upgraded seismic code? And I noticed you had millions of dollars in there for seismic upgrades. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, one is the um, um, the um, seismic code it's built to is to walk away from, not to go back into. Right. And so as we have developed our, our dispatch center um, and our real time trading floor, our critical IT assets uh, are, are housed here in the rock. We're um, in, not only that, um, if we pancake our our garage and our warehouse and you can't get parts, then then that's no good either. So we're looking at uh, providing um, a updated uh, upgraded seismic package so that uh, with inspection, uh, you know, we can reasonably expect to to reuse the building after a, a large earthquake. Otherwise, um, uh, we did have some backups and some of that plan for the um, uh, at least for this the SCADA and dispatch over there at Hayden Bridge, but we've scaled that way back and that made that building uh, a lot more affordable and, and it was more cost effective to do the work here at, at the uh, at the rock. Oh, well, thank you. I, I would hope that some of that uh, because of the resiliency things could be maybe applied for in federal grants uh, because to, to build it to essential service uh, like the police department and like uh, like the hospitals I know is very expensive and um, a lot of those entities sometimes get federal grants to do that. So hopefully if we're going to put that in the budget in a 10 year plan, we could look to other sources of income. Hopefully. Yeah, that's a good thought. So that's that's all I have for now. Thank you. All right, Sonia, I'm not sure if you are there or if you have any questions or comments. I'm here. Uh, I'm going to pass for right now. I'm just listening in. Thank you. Great, then over to you, Dick. OK, thank you. I have two questions and a comment. Um, I noticed that from your slides we have an eight hundred and fifteen million dollar give or take uh, plant for electric and three hundred million for water. I noticed that on the as is um, for electric, we're looking at spending about thirty three million a year that you know I realize these aren't great. Um, statistics, but that that means on average we're going to replace that plant in twenty six years. Recognizing that a lot of some of that 30, um, 3 million goes into strategic investments that are more than just replacements. On the water side, we have a 300 million investment. And if you take out the second source and set it aside for the moment, we're proposing a, about a $19 million, which means that we'd be replacing the plant, uh, at least metaphorically, in uh, 16 years. That causes me to wonder, you know whether we're adequately funding our um, capital program, particularly on the electric side. Um, so yeah, I, think uh, that, um, I just got a, a quick comment on that. Sure. So if, if you look at the water system and they are different animals, if you look at the water system, we're spending a great chunk of water or, or money on Hayden Bridge and the reservoirs. And so those are once in 40, 50, 60 year kind of projects. So if you spread it out over the, um, the, if you took a 60 year life and did three cycles on the electric, you might come up with a different, uh, more of a, a one to one conclusion. OK, thanks. Well, I, I, I still have a little bit of a concern about maintaining adequate capital funding on the electric side. I think maybe I from some of your comments in the presentation that you would share that. I'm not sure yes. I would go all the way to 
the um, e total expansion that um, is the option or the, the bookend that you've got. Um, another question I have is that, you know, when I joined the board and I think um, at the time Frank was, um, was the chief engineer or the um, person bringing us capital presentations on the electric side, there was a lot of discussion about opportunities to optimize the system so as to reduce our capital investment um, over time um, with the notion that we were overbuilt, at least in some areas. Uh, are we done with that initiative or are we still have more work to do there or is there are there further opportunities? Um, whatever happened to that um, that thread? Well, that's a bit of a pet peeve with me that the that saying the system's overbuilt, I don't think is very accurate, but um, I, I don't think we're thinking about it in quite the same way now. I think it's more about uh, utilizing uh, one of the things that, so we may be overbuilt from a capacity standpoint, but from a redundancy standpoint, we've got some weak spots out, out west. So you can have all the capacity you want, but if you can't keep it connected, you're not not reliable. So. Um, really, it's more focused on replacing the key pieces now uh, on on keeping the the reliable path, secondary paths, the the system intact. Um, and we may need that capacity if um, ten years from now, the you know if we hit that that uh, what do they call it the shoehorn with electric vehicles um, and it shoots up, we we may just use that capacity and be very happy we have it. So. I, I think what we're trying to do is take a more uh, holistic approach now to to planning and and bring in asset management and and some of those kind of things. So so I wouldn't say that the the concept is completely gone, but I would say that we're kind of building on that and and moving forward with it. One one note I would add into what Rod just said, um, Commissioner Helgeson, is that there are parts of the system where there's there's added capacity or additional capacity. Um, those are also the parts of the system that are aging. And so, you know, when you look at, um, you know, the total plant and service and you try to optimize that, um, you're, you're, I think optimization is probably the key word. Um, there's also areas where we think that that there is going to be redundancy and capacity and resiliency that's needed. So it's 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 not that we've abandoned that. I think we're refining it as we go forward uh, with the resiliency lens. I, I would also agree with your comment about plant in service and age of system. Um, on the electric side, if they're, you know, looking at water and electric and where we have planned, sort of previously planned, I would say there's opportunities on the electric side to turn the dial up. Some of that is because of the relationship of, of age of system and replacing assets. You throw on top of that capacity and resiliency for electrification, and then you throw on top of that the potential of, of sort of a situational um, challenge like a, a Lieberg canal. Uh, because we're talking planning, if anything, I would turn the dial up from a planning perspective on the electric side and probably keep it as planned on the water side until we refine the second source uh, direction a little further. But we haven't abandoned what you just mentioned. It's just being refined and um, looked at it in a little different way going forward. Okay, well, I a little bit of a comment. Oh. My time is up. Um, I do have a comment on second source, but I'll wait to see if there's a second round. And the last question was really just because I hadn't heard anything about optimization in, in a while. So it sounds like I may or may not, but that's OK. Your, your, your response was informative. All right, Tyler, was there something you wanted to add? Oh, yeah, I was just going to kind of finalize that same comment Commissioner Helgeson was talking about, which was the uh, the capacity question. One specific example I mentioned was power transformers, and in the past, when the system was built, uh, it was decided, you know, to do two 20 megawatt units at each substation. Basically, that's 40 megawatts. One decision we've made since then is to move to a standard of a 30 or 33 megawatt unit, which the cost is really proportional to that amount of copper. So that's kind of one example pointing to a decision we've made to reduce that capacity of the substations we do touch that 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 did carry forward from I think when Frank was was in the chair in the engineering department. Okay. 
So that, that is something that's a cost saving measure. Thank you. All right. Is there anybody else? Is there a consensus if people want a second round of questions? I don't have anything else to add. I appreciate the presentation. Looks like a good plan to me. That's Dick. Ma'am, just make a quick comment then on second source. I, I agree, and I think the rest of the board would agree with the notion of pushing any assumed expenditure for second source uh, investment out a year or kind of resequencing that as you update the, the capital plan on the water side. Um, I support that because we're, I, I think clearly we're not ready to move forward with anything specific and we don't know what, it, what it's going to be or how it's going to develop. Um, so I think for that reason, it makes sense not to put the expenditure in as early as we had planned otherwise. But I don't think that, at least from my perspective, when we um, delayed or postponed implementation, that we were taking it off the table. I think we just wanted better clarity about how it related to uh, uh, regional opportunities and options that might allow us to either do it more cost effectively or move through clearly some of the roadblocks that we face. And I don't feel like we're making much progress on that front. And I'm not sure when, if ever, we'll have it back in the plan if we don't get to a point reasonably soon as to where we have a clearer picture of, of what we're planning to do move, moving forward. So I don't need a response to that, but I just that's where my anxiety lies with respect to the second source question is let's let's get after it so we can put something in the in the 10 year financial plan. And I realize that it's not staff's um, responsibility in entirety because um, there are some clearly open questions that need to be resolved. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner Helgeson. I, I think we we agree that it's important to keep it in the financial planning process. Um, it's an important piece of resiliency. Details, without getting into too many details, um, there's a number of hurdles and opportunities that, that we're working on to try to provide more and more clarity as we move forward. So I think that our views are consistent on that and getting to it is, is part of it. All right, thank you very much. We are going to move on to uh, item number 10, correspondence and board agendas. Frank? Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Schlossberg. Appreciate it. Um, there were a few pieces of correspondence. There were actually five in total. I don't know if the, the commissioners had any questions on that. There was um, the annual um, integrated resource planning update, some proposed, um, actually fairly simple revisions to a customer service policy. Um, there was a uh, competitive salary memo for the general manager's salary that was worked on um, by our chief workforce officer, Lena Kostopoulos, um, primarily with uh, um, a follow-up from Commissioner Helgeson. Uh, we had some proposed changes that, and, and again, these are correspondence, so there's no action, but it was kind of a heads up for, for future actions in some cases. Um, task order process for a particular contract where we're just bringing things back to the board routinely. And then um, our enterprise, uh, our annual enterprise risk management update report. And so those were correspondence. We would, uh, we have people standing by if the commissioners have any questions on those and we'd be happy to to answer those um, at this point. Okay, is there anybody that has any questions? Dick? You're muted. Sorry. Um, I first wanted to acknowledge the time that uh, Chief uh, Workforce Officer uh, Kostopoulos spent with me following up on um, our request that there be some documentation relative to the management of general manager's salary. I, I requested that not because we had a problem, but because um, 
we didn't um, spend a lot of time working the mechanics of that this year uh, and that I just wanted to make sure there was something in the record that documented how all of that was intended to work and how it related to um, consistency that, that Frank and we had sought with respect to how the uh, compensation is managed um, within the utility for um, for the utility as a whole. So I just wanted to appreciate that and note that it's now in the record and available for future consideration uh, if the board wants uh, uh, a reference that would help um, illuminate that. Um, and then just quickly, I wanted to ask a question um, that could be answered actually offline. Um, I just wasn't sure I understood what was being proposed with respect to the memo on Carmen Smith contracts, and I'm tracking with what we've done to sort of authorize the 10 million and then carve out by work order specific amounts, but I'm not. And I think what the bottom line was with this memo was that you're no longer going to bring us the individual components of that. You're going to work within the 10 million that we have already authorized unless it rises above the half a million level. So was that the significance of that memo? Yeah, I think Commissioner Helgeson, it was just recognizing that when we we have a contract that we've approved with work orders, we would change the threshold slightly so that the board isn't approving things that are really part of a scope that is has already been looked at and approved. As long as it's working within that scope, um, it's it's really changing the thresholds of which we, we will still bring some things back to the board. It's just a slightly different threshold when we have a pre-approved um, contract, you know, overarching contract. Is that intended to apply solely to Carmen Smith, where we've done a rather large carve out for multiple projects, or does that apply generally where we have um, any contract that involves work orders? This this was a request specifically for the Carmen Smith contract. All right, uh, so it's not a change in our policy per se. Yeah, not not yet. I mean, I, I think it would be something that depending on the size and nature of this, that um, it could be evaluated as a policy change in the future where that's not this particular request. I, I think it's just an opportunity to try it and see see if it if it works like you said. Contracts when they get to us or projects or programs when they get to a certain size, uh, the board has a lot of awareness and knowledge of them. That's that's different um, than just bringing a con, a, you know, one big large contract on the board. So I, I, this is specific to Carmen Smith, um, and you know, we're, not to rule out a policy change in the future, but I, it's not intended to be that at this point. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So hearing, oh, I'm uh, Commissioner Carlson. You had a question. Oh, I'm unmuted. Great. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, one, I'm sorry that we had to add some language on there uh, about the uh, meter reading. Sounds like there's probably some incidents there. Um, I think that's unfortunate, um, but I think it's the right thing to do. So. I'm glad we're, you know, taking the health and safety of our staff seriously and um, moving forward with that. And I, I also wanted to say that I appreciated the language in the integrated, no, in the uh, the EPR, no, <laughs> can't remember the name, the emergency response planning. I know that right. you were looking, adding it language about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I really appreciated that that was a portion of what you were looking at. Um, as you're doing this review. So those are my two comments. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Those are those are accurate observations of, of the the motivation behind it. I don't see any others. The second half of, of my particular piece in the agenda here is to look at upcoming agendas. Um, there's some interesting uh, activity in August. Um, we We'll get a chance to give the board a, a view of the first half of the year. It's, it's been an interesting half of the year um, to, to say the least. Um, so we'll provide our results for the first half. Uh, we also have on the agenda to give the, the board its, its first view of the results of our electrification uh, analysis and study. 
Um, I think that's um, has some pretty interesting um, information that that uh, will be of interest to the board and others in the community as far as our capacity to um, electrify other applications. And so um, that's on on tap. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about strategy in the headquarters building um, and kind of uh, what our go forward plans are for that. And so and then and then September uh, we start to get into more upriver activity and a lot more around um, financial planning and some of the next stages with that. So um, a lot of good things on the agenda coming up. Um, really excited about some of the information that that staff is putting together. I've, I've seen a lot of it uh, in its sort of early and evolving stages and so um, excited for the August meeting. I, I will also mention the August meeting we are preparing to have um, a little bit of a change in the agenda. Probably very first thing we will actually, even if it's virtual, look to have a um, live call in public um, forum, public uh, commentary, so or testimony rather. And so even if we have a virtual meeting, we will have members of the public who can participate early in the meeting with public testimony. So that's uh, we're planning around that um, if we're still in the um, state that uh, we're in now, which is to be virtual and, and separated. So um, that's the sort of the coming attractions and um, we we'll look forward to that and entertain any questions about that if, if commissioners have them. Seeing none, I guess I will pass it back to uh, Vice President Schlossberg for next item on the agenda. OK, so we are on ag agenda item 11 board wrap up. So Commissioner Brown, we'll start with you as we go in alphabetical order. Well, thank you. Um, I just feel like to com compliment uh, staff and everybody else. I, I think it was a great meeting and Mindy, I think you did a great job of uh, herding uh, cats. Uh, congratulations on doing that and looking forward to a, a more of it next year. So thank you very much. All right, Commissioner Carlson. I agree. Great job, Mindy. Thank you so much for leading the meeting. And I'm sorry that I had extra challenges that made that a little more awkward this evening. <laughs> Appreciate it. And Dick, over to you. I too appreciate your meeting uh, uh, management being one of the more problematic of the cats. Um, I uh, just wanted to mention that I'm in the process of considering a road trip for August, which may affect my ability to attend. I'll try to manage that so as not to be absent, but um, I just wanted to give you a heads up that that uh, is being considered. Um, I also wanted to mention that or ask a question that doesn't need to be answered here, but relates to the request for an option that might involve a rate increase next year. I recall that we, you know, the longer we go without an increase, the more the potential is for our rate classes to get out of whack with the customer uh, with the, with the cost of service study. And so as we move further into the budget process and in conjunction with any discussion about the need or not for a rate increase next year, I'd, I'd like an update on, on kind of where we think we sit relative to that equity question um, as it relates to um, deferring increases when our cost structure may be changing in ways that would otherwise affect um, the rate levels for different classes. So um, thank you for that and um, I think it was a good meeting. Okay, um, only thing that I would like to add is I've been on this board for a year and a half and I've noticed a streamlining of the presentations. Something with the design is getting um, much easier for a lay person like me to understand. So I just want to um, give an appreciation to whoever's in charge of the design, but I think that um, staff is doing a really great job with the presentations. And then also um, last month I gave a shout out to IT for helping um, facilitate all these meetings and again this format just keeps getting better unfortunately we have to do it this way and maybe by the time we have it completely perfect we'll be ready to meet in person again but otherwise um, 
it's this has been very smooth. So Frank, I don't know if there's any last things that you'd like to say or if you covered that in your last year. Uh, not, not quite. I would I would echo. Um, I, I think as we get into fall, uh, we will start start talking about more details around budgets, around rates, uh, revenue requirements being the first thing and then um, the actual uh, COSA analysis as part of that, but both upriver related and just in general. Um, I do think, um, Commissioner Helgeson, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before where we did not have a re overall revenue change, but we did make uh, changes between the classes. And so we have continued to do that uh, within the guidance that the board has provided. I don't think we made a change this last year because there wasn't something significant, but I think that's an important point. Uh, as part of the process. It's not just about the overall revenue, it's about the structure within. So we'll look forward to those conversations, um, uh, really getting into the heat of that this fall. Um, so it's 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 a, no, a point noted and, and I'm sure um, staff um, heard that and, and we'll be bringing things back to the board. So uh, other than that, I you know appreciate all the feedback. I think we've got some good feedback tonight. Um, and appreciate it and we'll continue to push forward and I would just uh, like encourage people to stay safe and um, um, you know thanks for all your all your help. All right well then exactly on one minute past schedule 751 we are adjourned. Thank you everyone. Thank you commissioners. I don't think Mattel ever got within one minute, so that's that's probably a record. <laughs> well done, everyone. Good job, Holly. Indian. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you.